In this video, we're going to be answering several subscribers' questions about portable storage for content creation. Based on workflow and project requirements, we'll see how that comes together. We have several drive storage calculators and a chart we're going to take a look at because your requirements and parameters can change and the technology changes. But we want to show you some general ideas in no particular order as we have some links into Amazon and B&H to show you what you're looking for. But we want to give you specifics on the requirements on how to determine what your needs may be. And a lot of the stuff we do about technology with computers for me is really simple and easy to understand. And, and very one, two, three when we're talking about PCI Express lane allocations and when we're looking at chipsets for those resources and we're looking at processors. But when you start talking about drive storage technologies and you start looking at external portable storage, two technologies we want to address, USB-C and Thunderbolt. Okay, most of the questions we've had have been about Thunderbolt. And what we need to do is identify and look at how that fits because the, the first question that comes up is number one. But we have to cover this. Okay, Thunderbolt 3 and Thunderbolt 4. What's the difference? Bidirectional bandwidth. That's it. How does Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt 3, get 40 gigabit when PCI Express 3 is only 30 gigabit? Well, that's called marketing, and you can take Intel to task with that. However, what we're going to do is look at the numbers because that 30 gigabit is all we can do. Why? Well, to reiterate, Thunderbolt 3 and Thunderbolt 4 are both PCI Express 3. PCI Express 3 is four PCI Express lanes. Four PCI Express lanes is what we also have for M.2 NVMe. So those two are well-matched technologies for the bandwidth. However, as we look at these, we're going to be looking at SATA drives, SSDs, and M.2 NVMe. Okay, I've mentioned three, but that's actually four. I'll get into that. The only thing I'm going to mention about NACE will be as it relates to the bandwidth for 1 gigabit and 10 gigabit for what we need to do. And we're going to also look at a conversion chart so we can make sense of gigabit versus megabyte. Because I think a lot of that's very confusing as we go through those numbers. Okay, PCI Express 3.0, four lanes, is good for 30 gigabit. An M.2 NVMe drive is good for 3,500 megabytes. So... That translates to pretty close, you're right at it. And what we're going to see the greatest transfer is probably going to be around 2,700 megabytes because you've got overhead, you've got situations you've got to consider. Because in an external storage device, an easy way to look at this would be this memory stick. Even though you see one device here, there's actually uh, four things here in play. One, we have the device, the holder. Two, we have the memory inside, which is of great importance. Three, we have the connection, but then getting from this connection, which interfaces with the computer to the memory inside, is whatever the bridge chip is. And a lot of times, this technology with the connector and the bridge chip, those are designed to be together so they can maximize capacity and minimize price. Okay, on a device like this, uh, a question also will come up, well, why can't I just use a thumb drive? Those are good for up to two terabytes. Well, number one, Think of this as a sneaker network, but this is not used to be uh, used repeatedly all the time because these things generate heat. The bigger they are, uh, the less heat, but the smaller they are, the more heat they have, like the one we use for the uh, Windows installation. That little rascal gets hot, that little thumb drive. Okay, these get hot. Where do you think they dissipate the heat? Depending upon the device and depending upon the capacity, heat's going to go through that connector, which means from that connector of this device into whatever we're connected to. On a laptop, that's a bad idea. And heat being an issue what it is, what I would do is use these as they are supposed to be. For example, I create a presentation for Build or Buy. I put my notes on here. I copy those notes on here. I don't transfer them through the network because we're on separate networks and that's a whole other conversation. Just like NACE, whole other conversation. So these have their place, but this is not to be used for other three things we're looking at. A drive that could be an editing drive, could be transport drive, or could be storage. And storage can be short term or long term. And uh, how do you know when a drive becomes long term? When it gets full. That brings up another question. Okay, I'm downloading files to my whatever. We'll call this my whatever because I'm going I'm to use this drive as an example. 
and I like these drives, this is going to be one specific example. Now you notice the size of it. This will dissipate heat more. This is an SSD. But the reason I want to specifically show this is if you had this in a 2 or 4 terabyte size, okay, if you're downloading files to this, or if you're using this to edit, what will happen is you're downloading files, you'll say, why does my download not finish? Did you check the capacity of the drive? I would suggest do that. Or you're editing. Why doesn't the render finish or the export, whatever you want to call it? Why doesn't that finish? Did you check the capacity of the drive? Whatever device you use that we're going to go through with these specs, and it gets kind of interesting as we look at the different cameras and the, and the uh, bit rates, you need to check your device, I would say, about every three months because I've seen a lot of devices when I look at them from the uh, Windows Explorer that are in the red. What the red means is the drive is full. And when it's in red, that's too much. So what you need to configure and think about is number one, whatever storage you're going to use, how big is your video, how big is your edit going to be, and then you need to add 30% to that. When a drive is at 70%, consider it full. That gives you a little marginal headway. What you'll notice, and I don't care what the format of the drive is, uh, especially on spinning drives, is what you'll notice is as they fill up, when you're editing to the drive, they'll start to slow down so that as it does that auto save, it takes a little bit longer. And as it takes a little bit longer, a little bit longer, that's when you need to start thinking about migrating that data or migrating that drive, whatever, whatever choice you have. It's always clone image or backup. That's not a discussion a lot of people want to have. Different video, we've had it before. Not a lot of people watch it, but it's, it's relevant. Okay, as it relates to the device, if we're looking at something like this, let's start with a calculator because a lot of this starts with a beginner, and as most of the questions have been about Thunderbolt storage, we go from uh, USB-C to Thunderbolt, and then the question comes up about RAID and RAID arrays. And there's two things I'm looking for in a RAID array that I'll, I'll touch on when we get to that, when we're looking at capacity. Because uh, the two things you're going to look for first, beyond the two things I'm going to tell you about, is one about speed and capacity. So we have a subscriber in Germany. And she's getting ready to get a fantastic laptop that I had the opportunity to, to spec for her. And I'm as excited and stoked about that as, as she is, but she's the one that's going to use it. Okay, I told her what the formulas were we were working with. I told her what she needed once I got her up to where it needed to be. What we worked with, because she's in Germany, sprick, I don't sprick into Deutsch, as I've mentioned before, comparing the German specs with the U.S. specs, what we were able to realize and understand was, number one, it's Adele. Number two, it's a workstation. Now, for those that talk about content creation on a Dell, I don't classify those as content creation. I wouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole. But what you need is what the workstation has access to based on capacity for the processor, the video RAM, and the amount of RAM in the machine. And the other spec that's not talked about that we're going to focus on is how do you know how much storage space you're going to need for a particular project. Okay. I told her starting out, she has Thunderbolt 4. My, my suggestion, the lowest common denominator for speed would be something that works on USB-C. That way it'll work anywhere, but preferably Thunderbolt 4 because what if she has to take that data from that laptop she's working with to another laptop? So I want to show you a chart. We'll see what we're working with because someone's starting out. I know the parameters, but I want you to understand those parameters and why. And of course, as always, Everything that I'm talking about, anything I mention, if I forget, y'all remind me, and I'll put it in the description, as well as these storage calculators. Now, what we want to focus on is 1080. The parameters we're working with at 1080, a bit rate of 5 megabit, is going to give us one minute of video. It's going to take 20 megabytes, and the recording duration is going to be for 50 minutes. Now, what we want to do is to take those numbers and see where that progresses, because what you start out with and where you end up with may be two different things. And my recommendation for someone starting out, based on those parameters for a video, a 2 to 4 terabyte drive. And the technology we're going to look at can go from 2 to 4 to 8 terabytes. And again, we're concerned about bandwidth and we're concerned about capacity, but we're also concerned about growth capability. Now this calculator is a little bit more expansive, but there are others that get into more details, but this will do what we need for starters. What if we're looking at H.264 1080? That's what we'd have for a YouTube video. Our resolution will be 1920 by 1080. Our frame rate could be 23.98. More likely in the U.S. will be 29.97. You can see what happens to our capacity. And if somebody is recording at 60, you can see what happens to our capacity. And if you're going to do anything for slow motion, 
you could be up to 120 frame rate and you're looking at 174 gigabytes and that's going to get you one hour okay what if we're recording for one day eight hours we now go to 1.36 terabyte so you do the math a two terabyte drive is just about going to do that for a day that's just the video you record then you got to consider the render plus 30 percent so you can see how capacity changes now for most people probably going to be H.264 1080, 1920 by 1080 resolution, and the frame rate at 29.97. If they're recording for a day, eight hours, that's 350 gigs. What if we look at that for a week and we take that to 40 hours? We're now at 1.69 terabyte. What if we take that to a month, and that would be 160 hours, we're going to need seven terabytes. So you get some idea of how that can grow exponentially. Now, on average, my expectation for most people that are starting out, you're probably going to have about a 30-minute video. The kind of stuff I shoot will cover that. I've got another calculator I want to show you, even one for B-RAW that is pretty wicked. But to give you some idea of how this can grow exponentially, a beginning user, if we're looking at uh, a 30-minute video for YouTube, and they're going to record 30 minutes, and then they're going to edit, let's say, 30 minutes. That's an hour, plus the 30%. Okay, one hour video a week for 52 weeks, we're less than 60 hours. Right now, I've got 160 on here. So let's look at see what 60 hours looks like. That's about what I would expect on average. So if we drop that down to 60 hours, we're now at 3 terabytes. So they're going to be a little tight, but a 4 terabyte drive would work. And a two terabyte drive, if we cut that in half, you know, change one thing changes everything. If we drop that down to 30 hours, a two terabyte will be fine for a year. So you can see how that change one thing changes everything. Again, to me, this is a lot more complicated than just what drive do you recommend because we need to understand the technology. All we're looking at are the formulas to get some idea of capacity and we're looking at bandwidth. Now, this is another calculator that I really like. Let's take a look for a camera. For example, if we have a, uh, let's say a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera, 6K, and the codec we're going to use will be Blackmagic RAW, 3 to 1, and the resolution we're going to film in is going to be, let's say, let's go for the whole thing, 6144 by 3456, and let's say our frame rate is probably going to be 25 movie format, and our recording time, right now the data rate, is 2,584 megabit. If we want to record for 8 hours, our file size is going to be 9 terabytes. So you can see how that can grow and how that can change. Okay, let's think about the drive speed technology. If we're looking at SATA, SATA 3 is 600 megabytes in burst mode. Sustained throughput for SATA 3 is about 150 megabytes per second. And if we were looking at uh, an SSD, again, we could get just a hair under 600 megabytes because an SSD can sustain a faster throughput than a spinning hard drive. We're talking single devices, 150 megabytes. Okay, an M.2 NVMe PCI Express 3 is 3,500 megabytes. So those are numbers and parameters we kind of need to keep in our head and think about what we're looking at for what we're going to be doing. Now, everything I do, I do with spinning drives because it meets my needs. And a spinning drive, based on the parameters I first showed you, does a job beautifully. I normally render and do my work to a two terabyte drive, but I come through the network, a one gigabit network. And if we were looking at 10 gigabit, remember 10 gigabit is about the same as USB-C. Think about that. Now, some of these are easier to find than others, but I want to show you this as an example. This is an SSD and this particular SSD, and you need to always check your specs because the spec of the drive is not about the price, although that will be reflected. You have to look at what kind of throughput do you need for the capacity. If you can work with a spinning drive, I like to take spinning drives, but then again, I like the hot swap racks. Even when I'm working through the network, I can render to a spinning drive because my bit rate does not require me to have a fast drive. It just has to have a drive connected. However, as the drive fills, I can tell when I'm doing a render or a save if I'm running out of space for the reasons I've just talked about. So knowing these numbers as you're looking at the device, do you need that throughput as you're looking at the capacity? These are things you have to consider for the amount of time for the storage drive you're looking at to look at your work environment and see how that meshes together. Now this particular technology is USB-C 
this will go up to a four terabyte. And we've got a throughput of 1,050 megabytes. And let's look here at the fine print based on what things we've just talked about. That is an NVMe storage device. That's why it's able to get 1,050. Now, NVMe, if we're on Thunderbolt, we can get faster than that, probably up to 27, 2800. But based on a USB-C connection, 1,050 for M.2 NVMe. If this were a plain old straight SSD, we would max out at about 600 megabytes and probably more like around 500 megabytes would be more realistic. Five to maybe 575. This is something though you have to look at and see and compare, but that's an example. Now this particular device, I like Sabrent has a package and I've shown this one before that we use for proof of concept for do a Windows install. Let me show you this. This is of the same type of technology. This is a Sabrent enclosure that I put the M.2 NVMe drive in here that meets the requirements that we were trying to meet. However, I can put up to an eight terabyte drive in here. So this type of technology will give me access to USB-C and with an adapter I could use USB-3. However, I don't want to do USB-3 for any of this stuff. For what we're going to do for video, we need to be able to have a drive we can render on, a drive that can transport, or a drive that can be storage. Now storage long term can be a slower device. But to have a drive that we work with, we've got to have fast access. And I don't want anything any slower than necessary. But I want to have the capacity so I can work on a project. Now, a beginner's needs for what they want for a year or two are a whole lot different than a professional's needs for what they may need for just one month. That's why I want to go through some of these devices and outline and show you what I like about them, where I see problems with them. Because when we start getting into RAID, I've mentioned two items, but there's still two more items of tantamount importance that we need to talk about. So again, this is Sabrent Rocket. It's Thunderbolt 3, up to 2,700 megabytes. Now see, I like that. Two terabytes. Now for a rendering drive and quick access, you have to think too about a device like this. This is something I can put in my pocket, but it's big enough to hold an M.2 NVMe drive, still dissipate the heat because the cable attached is not going to transfer heat to the device that I'm rendering with if that's how I'm going to use it or if I'm going to transport storage. It depends on capacity, it depends on your need. As we go for larger drives, for larger capacity, because we need to maintain bandwidth, then we go from something we can fit in a pocket to something that fits in like the bag of a laptop to something that fits in like a case, an SKB type case. And there are some drives I want to take a look at that meet those requirements as well. So that's another device that would work for what we need. We get our fastest access with Thunderbolt 3. So this will support both Thunderbolt 3 and USB-C. The USB-C will give us 900 megabytes, which is about right. But on Thunderbolt, we'll get 2700 megabytes. So that's phenomenal. But if you don't have access to Thunderbolt, not going to do any good. Now we've got one subscriber that's using a Cinema Red camera that uh, he just built his WRX80. Congratulations. However, it's an Asus motherboard, so I know for a fact he doesn't have access to Thunderbolt. So his fastest access is going to be USB-C. So knowing both those numbers for the device you're working with, the camera you're working with, and the machine you're on, you have to consider your options. His other option would be something on NACE, but even NACE with 10 gigabit, unless he can uh, aggregate that bandwidth, is still going to be at that speed of USB-C. All these things you have to think about, which means for him, a working drive, he needs to transfer that data to that machine internally. And once it's internally on one of the M.2 NVMe drives or on an internal RAID array, then he can edit and do in his rendering, then copy it off to whatever storage media or upload it to wherever the uh, client has an expectation to view it. Now Lacey also has some devices. I'm kind of on the fence on some of the Lacey stuff. Uh, this is a drive I would be comfortable with. It's USB-C. It's four terabytes. It's got this all enclosure, rugged enclosure on it. And then if it's something that you need that meets your expectations, you know, for the price, for USB-C, it's not too bad. But you'll notice that's a hard drive. So if that's got a hard drive in it, that means that's only going to be capable of 150 megabytes. Let's look and see if it'll tell us or if we have to go dig for this. Now see, it doesn't spell it out. If that's a hard drive, it's good up to 150 megabytes. If that is an SSD, it could be up to 600 megabytes. And if they're not telling, they don't want you to know that. Now the other option is to get the version that is an SSD for the speed. And yes, the price goes up, but 
this is not actually just an SSD. This is an M.2 NVMe SSD. So we get 1,050 megabytes. Big difference. So again, are the three types of drive, a transport drive, an editing drive, or uh, a storage drive. If this is something that meets your needs, then great. Now, typically a laptop, this laptop that we spec'd, which was not available configured this way in the US, she's going to have a one terabyte M.2 NVMe drive for the boot drive, which is fantastic. However, the cache will go there. That's the default for the program she's going to use to edit with. But the problem is the video files, she's going to need something that's going to have fast access or else it's going to bog her whole machine down. She has the CPU power, she has the video power, and she also has the RAM to make that thing really sing but she needs storage. So my suggestion is fast storage. Something like this would work, but it's going to be medium term to short term, meaning she'll get about a year's use out of this based on the parameters that I've talked about. Now, if those parameters change and she shoots longer videos at a higher resolution that require a higher bit rate, then that goes up exponentially very, very quickly. But getting started is where we're at. So that's another option. Pluggable also has a two terabyte Thunderbolt drive. Now this one claims up to 2400 megabytes, which is closer to what the spec should be. 2400 megabytes on the read and 1800 megabytes on the write. Any of these M.2 NVMe drives on an external Thunderbolt device is going to be PCI Express 3, so keep that in mind. And the largest drives that I'm aware of are 8 terabyte. There are several. Uh, for example, like I mentioned, this device that we uh, put together for proof of concept, specifically for USB-C, so that we could do a Windows install. Okay, we can put an 8 terabyte drive in here, but it's only USB-C. I didn't want to experiment with Thunderbolt until I had proof of concept. Now that I have proof of concept, I can see putting an 8 terabyte drive in here to have access to this on a laptop. But again, it depends on your specific needs and what your requirements are, because you know, change one thing changes everything. Now another option I like is what SanDisk has, and anything you read about these, be sure and check the reviews because uh, sometimes you have to read between the lines. These are SanDisk Professional. G Drive, not G RAID, but G Drive was bought by SanDisk and of course SanDisk Western Digital. So if I were looking at something for this kind of work for video content creation, when I started out with this, it looked like SanDisk was going to be like the uh, number one thing, but they, they can do what a lot of my requirements are. And this is a drive that can work to do what we're talking about for video, for content creation, for video storage. I remember back there was a time when we were looking at drives and, one, and concerned and wondering about thermal calibration, but I haven't heard anybody use that term in a very long time. However, this is a 12 terabyte enterprise class drive. It's an ultra store, good for up to 195 megabytes. That is a spinning drive. That is a good place to be at 12 terabytes if you need the capacity. And it's on USB-C, so a drive like this. Now, for me personally, I like those items separate because an external device, like we've talked about, is made up of four items. You've got the container. You've got the connection coming out, which is USB-C or Thunderbolt. You have the memory that's inside. Then you have the bridge chip. I like to have the memory separate, so if I have a problem, I can fix it. Advantages and disadvantages. For those that do that kind of stuff, it's a build or buy situation, classic. Uh, that's just where I'm at. So a situation like this, I'm okay with it, but if I have a problem with the drive, the whole thing is someone else has got to repair it. My ability to repair that may be limited if I can't open it and put a drive in to suit my needs. Because a device like that, if I had just the device, I could put the drive in at the capacity I want. When that drive is full, I can pull it out, archive it, put another drive in, and keep going on down the road. So I mention that and throw it out there. But I like the fact the technology, you have to understand, it will, it will meet our needs. The technology is not a perfect match because of the bandwidth. However, based on capacity and the interface, we maximize that capacity, but we're not maximizing the bandwidth of the connection. We're maximizing the bandwidth of the drive because at 195 megabyte, that's a, uh, that's quite a stretch when you're only capable of about 150 megabyte throughput. So even though they advertise it at 195 megabyte, keep that in mind, about 150 megabyte, something you got to think about. It's kind of like uh, that old question about, as I mentioned to reiterate a while ago about why does uh, Thunderbolt 3 spec out 
at 40 gigabit, Intel marketing, when it's only capable of PCI Express 3, which is four lanes, which is 30 gigabit, not 40 gigabit, but it is what it is. Next drive. And this type of drive is available from a 4, 6, 12, or 18 terabyte, depending on what your needs are. And I don't have a problem recommending that technology for the drive for a beginner. Now, for somebody a little more advanced, I want to show this because this is, uh, if you go with something like this, these types are available in this configuration from a 48 to a 96 to 144 terabytes. Okay, that would be the kind of project drive that you would use. And if we look at the storage base, it doesn't show us. But this is a SanDisk Professional 96 terabyte G-RAID using Enterprise class drives. Those are probably, uh, well, they're Western Digital Enterprise. They could be red. Hopefully those are Western Digital Gold drives. Thunderbolt 3 and USB-C, it'll do both. And here's the other things why I wanted to mention this now to bring in. When you go to a larger capacity, and I want to show a justification for this by looking at the qualifications for a red digital cinema camera. If you're looking at something like this for a professional camera, you're looking at a storage drive that's good for probably 30 days to work on a project, which is something like this, what it would be. Okay, we have the bandwidth, we have the throughput that can handle the bit rate that's going to be required, and we have the capacity, and that's probably uh, in that size going to last for a project of about one month to get that project put together. And that would be something you put on a digital imaging technician or what they call a DIT cart. Now, a drive like that, because it's like the size of a uh, small computer tower, you're going to also want to get the case for it that goes with it to uh, protect it, which is bigger than a laptop. But I, but I mentioned that, not digress. It's just you have to think about all those parameters. Let's take a look at a calculator and see how something like that works out. Now this is a calculator from RED for recording time, and I just find this fascinating. Uh, by default, it shows a RED Ranger with the uh, high speed RED Mini Mag, and we have a resolution of 8K full format and a frame rate of 24. Uh, the RED code, 8 to 1, usable space, 240 gigs. And the data rate on that is going to be 162 megabytes a second, and the typical uh, maximum recording time is 25 minutes. Okay. What if we say we have, and it's only going to show it in gigabytes, so what if we have 2,000? 2, 2,000 gigabytes, which would be 2 terabytes, that'll give us 211 minutes. So what if we go to uh, 40,000 gigabytes, which would be 40 terabytes? Yeah, okay, the calculator works. That gives us 4,210 minutes, and the data rate is 162 megabytes a second. Okay, at 162 megabytes a second, we can't do that. On a spinning drive we can do that on an SSD but if we're in a RAID no sweat so what if we had but that's only 4210 minutes so what if we had an 80 terabyte click out of it that'll give us 8420 minutes I'm doing this to kind of help you to see how to match the project to the drive you're going to need for the capacity you're working with based on the bit rate because everything about the bit rate matters for the throughput on the drive and change any one of these things changes everything because the way this has to mesh together. This has to be a purpose-built project drive for whatever you're going to do, whether you build it like I like to do or whether you buy it. Because some situations you can buy the rack, put the drives in you want, and then uh, do what you need to do. Okay, two requirements I'm going to have that I'm going to look at for RAID. Number one, it has to be a hardware RAID. If it's not a hardware RAID, move on. Number two, does the device power down? In other words, does the device go into power saving mode or will the device stay up as long as the computer's up? So what you want to do is make sure the computer is always in performance mode, not power saving mode, because this is a performance project. Because if the drive device goes to sleep and each one of those drives goes to sleep, it takes time for all that to wake back up. And if you're working on a project, no, 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 you can't have that. That thing's got to be up full time always. It's either on or off. There's no, there's no waking up from this. So to reiterate, hardware best RAID. And number two, no power saving. Because a lot of times you'll see people talk about RAID where the drive goes off blind because it went into power saving mode. And the RAID array thinks there's something wrong with the drive. So the RAID array is messed up and it's got to rebuild. 
Okay, the other issue you want to look at is what kind of RAID does it support in hardware? Because the only thing the operating system should do is to be able to set the file format. Now, with most stuff, and when I say stuff, I mean the computer environment you're working in. If you're working in Windows, I like NTFS. However, for portable access drives, it XFAT may be better for you. Depends. Uh, for example, we record the meeting to an SSD recorder, and I have to uh, format that for XFAT by default. It wants to format HPFS because it's for Mac. Mac don't work for me, but that's something you have to consider. You have to look at what format you work with. And yes, yes, there's, there's translation software for HPFS+. Plus. There's also translation software for the APFS file system. But what we work in is strictly in Windows. So if all the other computers are working in Windows, that simplifies the process. So just remember, any device you're looking at, once you get to the point where it's RAID, it's got to be hardware RAID. I can't emphasize that enough. You do not want software RAID because a software RAID means it's operating system. And if it's operating system, that's CPU based. The only thing a computer should do is format the disk. And number two, no power saving mode. If there's anything power saving about it, run. You do not want it. So that calculator will give you some idea when you're looking at a device like this and how do you comprehend and justify 48 terabytes, 96 terabytes, or 144 terabytes. Now, there are other versions of this that are smaller that have fewer bays. However, that's 8 bay. They have, I believe, a 4 bay and a 6 bay. It depends on your needs. A lot of these kind of devices, unless you know specifically what you're looking for, are easier to find at B&H. Now these little guys, I like this. This is SanDisk Professional, two terabyte G drive. It says SSD. It's actually an M.2 NVMe, and we're good for 1,050 megabytes. I like the format. I'm okay with the price. It looks like a solid device, and I think that should probably meet the needs of most people. However, two terabyte minimum. I would strongly encourage to go to a four terabyte. But if you're just starting out, start with a two terabyte. Then you may have to get another two terabyte, or go to a four terabyte but you know what your path is and what you're working with. Now this one I want to show specifically for the reason of B&H looks like the same drive 2 terabyte. However, Thunderbolt 3 as opposed to this one, which is USB-C. You got to watch that. That is USB-C, 1,050 megabytes for that price. But if you want the capacity and you want the throughput, you look at this drive, which is Thunderbolt 3, and that will give you the speed if you need it. If you don't need it on that size, then don't worry about it. And that's good for up to, as it says, 2,800 megabytes. I think you're probably pushing it, 27, 2,800. And again, of course, there's the 40 gigabit, but it's not. It's only 30. But I digress. I wanted to point that out, and I hope that helps. Now, here's one that I've shown before. And we'll take a look at it again. We have one of these that I use for testing. That's all I do with it. I don't do anything else with this drive because I got this for the purpose of being able to test USB-C on Thunderbolt. And as I, as I progress up the food chain, I get the Thunderbolt 3 card installed, make sure I've got the drivers and the firmware, all that we've done videos about. Then this I'll test with first, and this has an adapter that gets me to USB 3, but it's a USB-C device. And of course, it has the four components. It's an SSD. It's big enough to dissipate the heat, but I don't use it for any of that. I don't, I don't do anything with it except test with it. But once I've tested with this, then I progress to a Thunderbolt device that I then test the Thunderbolt connection before I actually work with the device. I always test and verify that stuff because, you know, things are finicky. Change one thing changes everything, and I like to make sure stuff works. But I wanted to show you this because I like these for the portability, and this is a 2 terabyte. And I believe these go up to 4 terabyte. Yeah, right here. And this shows it up to four terabyte. And these can be had at both Amazon and B&H. We'll put up links to both since we've talked about them. But I like the portability. I like the capacity. And I like the bandwidth. But if, you know, to reiterate, if you don't need one aspect, and this will get us, this says up to 1,000 megabytes, which is respectable. But if you need that capacity, but you don't need that throughput, so you have to consider what's going to best meet your needs. And I want to give you some idea of what you're looking for. Now, here's another idea of a SanDisk Professional G-Raid. This is a 12 terabyte, two bay RAID array. So this will take two six terabyte drives, which is already there. It has a Thunderbolt 3 interface. 
Let's see if it'll tell us the things we need to find out about. Comes pre-configured as RAID 0, so you get your capacity and you get your speed. It will support RAID 0, 1, and JBOD. The larger ones will support more. I've seen some that even support RAID 5. And no, I have not seen one yet that supports RAID 6 for an external device. And this is using two spinning hard drives. So each drive is capable of about 150 megabytes throughput. So you do the math, 150 times 2 is 300. Are you going to get 300 megabyte throughput? Absolutely not. But you will get probably over 200 megabytes. It, it just depends. Any, any of these devices, you need to test them. And whatever you get in the beginning is not what you're going to get in the end. In the end meaning once that drive fills up. Because drives like this that spin, once they fill up, they slow down. So again, remember that 30% capacity you need to leave empty or else you degrade performance and you get to the point where all of a sudden things don't download or things don't finish rendering. No space. Look in the Windows Explorer. Go to My Computer. If it's in the red, it's full. And you have to migrate some data off of it to get it out of the red. Will it hurt if you leave it? No, but you may not be able to... Uh, you may have difficulty trying to extract data. You'll have to extract data in small clumps instead of large clumps because there's no place for it to uh, work with a cache if it's trying to cache to the existing drive. But I digress. Now here's another example. This is a SanDisk 2 terabyte extreme, 2 terabyte, 4 terabyte, good up to 1,000 megabyte. And here's a G-RAID, 12 terabyte, 2 drives, 2 6 terabyte drives. And this type device is good for... 8 terabytes, 12 terabytes, 24 terabytes, or 36 terabytes. But remember, that's two spinning drives. And then the next question we need to find out, I did a search on the word hardware, and right there it is. This says this is a hardware RAID controller. That's significant, and it's RAID 0. This says it has a 20 gigabit Thunderbolt 2 cable with it. Well, you're not going to get that kind of speed, but you've got two 7200 RPM drives, so you can do the math. And it says it's Thunderbolt 3, but... Thunderbolt 3 for that device is a bit of a mismatch. But if you need Thunderbolt 3 access, you've got the bandwidth on the connection, but you don't have the bandwidth on the devices in the cage for the throughput on that connection. Now here's another one. This is a SanDisk Professional G-RAID, 8 terabyte, 8 bay. And in this configuration, this is good for 8, 16, and 32. And the other one we saw that was larger, and you'll notice the size of this, Again, there's a case that fits into. This has eight one terabyte drives. So you've got Thunderbolt 3, and this device will do RAID 0, 1, 1, 0, and RAID 5, 0. Thunderbolt 3 interface, pre-configured in RAID 5. Good to know. That's a pretty good package and a pretty good place to get started. Now the next question, Thunderbolt 3 uses the USB-C connection. We, the question is, can we plug this into USB-C port and will it work? I don't know, unless they tell us. It should work, but that doesn't mean it will. Here's what I want to know about hardware. Built-in hardware RAID. That's what I'm looking for. So I hope this gives you some ideas. We've needed to do this for a long time to talk about not only external storage and also about Thunderbolt storage, USB-C, because those are two different camps. But we needed to look at the throughput, and I've been trying to decide the best way and time to do it. And I think now's the time based on all the questions we're getting. You can't look at one without looking at the other to make this all work together. Because to have this work together, otherwise you're going to be like, I coulda, shoulda, woulda. And we like to avoid those coulda, shoulda, wouldas. It's all about knowing what you're doing and the path you need to progress down so you know the end result and where you're going. Because uh, those coulda, shoulda, wouldas can sometimes be gotchas. We don't, we don't like any of those. So I want to thank you guys for watching. This is Builder By. My name is Gil Boyd. We look forward to seeing you next video, which we're on to. We're out.